Hello. Hello, Lula. Hey, Joan. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And for some of you, it's almost good night time. Thank you all for joining. Couldn't resist. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so hi everybody. Uh, we are very happy to welcome you to this very special session of Poetry Across the Disciplines. Um, and again, uh, for those of you joining us from so many places around the world and from, from many different time zones, we really wanna thank you for um, making it through the magic of Zoom to be here with everyone tonight. So uh, we have a wonderful lineup of poets from across the disciplines, from medicine, architecture, psychology, science and technology, visual art, um, and this is to show everybody how poetry is, is actually, it's, it's a part of our everyday life. Uh, we are bridging the gap that has been made between sciences and arts through poetry. Um, we'd like to give thanks to our festival sponsors this year, uh, the American University in Dubai, of course, uh, Universita Gabriele D'Annunzio in Italy, uh, EBSCO Host Information Services in the Middle East, Montessori Academy Australia, Pedagogy and Beyond in the UAE, Salmon Poetry in Ireland, and the International Association for Union Studies. Um, I am Rola Maria, editor of Indelible, as many of you know, and uh, my co-host today is the lovely Dr. Elena Nistor, who is joining us from Bucharest, Romania. And, Hello, um, everyone. And before we introduce the speakers, I just want to take a moment here for a few reminders. Uh, please make sure to keep your mics muted during the talk in order to avoid any interfering background noise. Um, we will have a Q&A session um, the last 30 minutes of the, um, of the event. So you can feel free to enter your questions in the chat box, or alternatively, if you would like to use the microphone, you could also wait until um, the session and use the raise hand button so that we can call on you. And um, other than that, if you have, um, if we can help you in any way, um, please send, a, send either me or Dr. Elena a, uh, a small message and then we can see what we can do. And finally, without further ado, um, I am extremely delighted to welcome everyone who is in this incredible lineup today and I will um, hand it over to Elena. Thank you very much, Rola, for the invitation. It's, it's a great, great honor for me to be here and uh, to um, introduce our session of interdisciplinary poetry. Uh, poetry goes beyond pure individual imagination. With the art of high emotions sublimated into perfect language clarifies and intensifies private experience and activates different layers of perception. To me, and I think to everyone, a poem is a snapshot of life, an aesthetically pleasing instance of existence that connects ideas and concepts, attitudes and approaches, feelings and emotions. All these encapsulate and make ultimate sense of life by overcoming limitations and transgressing borders into a wider framework of deciphering the world in its complexity. Interdisciplinary studies are increasingly popular because simple classification is no longer enough to explore or fully understand a particular theme or area. We need a more inclusive way of looking at the world in order to apprehend its essence, not just through one perspective, but through multiple ones. Poetry is one way of achieving inclusiveness as it plays a paramount part in facilitating the connection between the inside and the outside and in situating the subject within its community. Poetic imagination creates an alternative reality that externalizes knowledge through the language. Its metaphors structure a code of human nature pertaining to a deeper understanding of real life. Words are the successful tool of communication in the sense of producing and exchanging meanings on grounds of absolute equality and perfect congruence. Although not always acknowledged, poetry is an interdisciplinary art as it bridges the gap between imagination and erudition. The relationship between poetry and other fields of study or strictly specialist subjects is not new. 
Poets like John Keats, Danny Abbs, and Edward Lowbury had solid training in medical sciences. And Humphrey Dewey was, Davy, sorry, Humphrey Davy was a renowned chemist and inventor. Similarly, John Benjamin was a fervent protector of Victorian architecture. And more recently, Joe Shapcott, Carolyn Duffy, and Sean Borrowdale wrote extensively on the topic of beekeeping which shows that there is no such thing as non-disciplinary knowledge. Theoretical information and practical facts cannot exist in a vacuum, in total isolation. They need to engage, circulate, and interact in order to be validated, accepted, and implemented. In our age of technology, the written and the spoken word is increasingly summoned to create new intellectual configurations and alliances and means to organize reality and to shape new spaces for the representation of the personal and the universal. The poets invited today will bridge the gap between art and systematized knowledge by sharing some verse inspired by science, music, yes. psychology, and medicine. And it is my privilege to welcome our first guest, Professor Fiona Sampson. Fiona Sampson is a leading British poet and writer published in 38 languages, who has received international awards in the US, India, Macedonia, Albania, and Bosnia. A fellow of the Royal Society of Literature of the English Association and of the Wordsworth Trust She's published 27 books and received an MBE for services to literature. She has served on the Council of the Royal Society of Literature and is a trustee of the Royal Literary Fund. Other honors include the Newdigate Prize, Chumley Prize, Hawthornden Fellowship, and the Words from the Arts Council of England and of Wales, Society of Authors, Poetry Book Society and the Arts and Humanities Research Council, as well as various Book of the Year selections. She's also a broadcaster and newspaper critic, libretist and literary translator, and was editor of Poetry Review between 2005-2012. Her internationally acclaimed In Search of Mary Shelley was shortlisted for the Biographers Club Slightly Fox Prize. She recently reviewed two major, received two major European prizes, the 2019 Naim Frasheri Laureateship of Albania and Macedonia, and the 2020 European Lyric Atlas Prize, Bosnia. Two-Way Mirror, her biography of Elizabeth Barrett Browning was published in 2021. She is Emeritus Professor of Poetry at Roehampton University. Dr. Sampson, I will hand out to you now. Thank you so much, Eleanor. And as usual, I feel embarrassed to hear such a lengthy um, and generous introduction. So thank you. And thank you to you and to very much to Rula Maria for this invitation. It's a joy to be back virtually in Dubai. And thank you too for your opening thoughts. I am keeping an eye on my 10 minutes, um, which were very thought provoking. Um, I really like the link between a high stakes role for poetry and poetry as um, a mediator with other disciplines. I like the way that both of you have framed this as a way of thinking about poetry as part of life rather than kind of disappearing into a further sub-specialization, the opposite, a kind of moving forward to embrace. I'm also really glad that you mentioned John Betjeman because it allows me to um, talk about something that oddly I do share with him, which is a passionate enthusiasm for um, architecture and vernacular architecture and church buildings, um, as well as actually, I have to say, buildings and place in general. I mean, when I travel, for example, my many visits to Romania, I have um, what I remember of places is often configured in kind of visual memory of, of buildings and places. But I know you invited me to, for my musical background, and I am going to start with a poem which 
is about my musical background, but actually turns out to be a poem about buildings, thus uniting both themes. Um, this was commissioned by um, the Britain Peers Foundation at um, Albra, where there's a big international music festival, which was set up by the British composer Benjamin Britten. And it's about Snape Malting's the uh, concert hall there, um, because we were asked to write about what Snape meant to us. It's called Marsh at Snape. We choose the room we need to live in, each of us imagining the beams, the walls, whitewash or stone, or maybe brick, the color of fire, where RSJs are simply steel, not metaphor. And the view from wide steel framed windows out of 1979 is ideal and fair as it frames the wild salt reserves where reeds stream purple brown into the wind. With you your whole life, fragments of pitch that might be birds or voices interrupted, how a grass bank curves diminishing to those old people doing Tai Chi in the past. The way the marsh rises and spreads like echoes into the sky. I'm going to go further back in time now from the 1970s to the Gothic and this poem, which is called The Nature of Gothic. And I find that I always have to footnote it, meaning not Gothic like Frankenstein's moth monster, but gothic like medieval um, arch church architecture. The Nature of Gothic, which is a title from John Ruskin. What does it want, this cool stone span, this bridge on air? What does it ask of us who come questioning, who move round its feet, our voices licking at space? Our desires make currents stir all up the air that asks us to see something wonderful, the roof of the world perhaps, expects some gravity to open in us, reflection or answer, but stone shifts endlessly into itself. It disappears and reappears like hours that slip out of mind, then reappear, having been lost to us while we were lost among the forest's pillars. I lived for a while in France, but then Brexit happened and I had to come back because income tax, all too complicated. But I lived near Rochmadour, which is um, a shrine in a, a limestone gorge where there was, um, a black Madonna. She's black because she's medieval and silver and the silver has tarnished. She's quite an archaic, strange shape. And she's a votary for um, seat for fishermen and seamen. So Lady of the Sea. Blue and black, the Virgin sits in her high palanquin. She does not regard us, her regard is drawn back from us, far back among the centuries where she comes from and where she is going. Already she is traveling past us and away, ancient star flying so slowly we do not see her move. Suppose she compassionate, uncoiled her serpent's arms or let that black mask fall. Could she move among us then or what would be broken and fired again? What understanding would be perfected? High and far, very high and far, like the disappearing note of wind shrilling between glass, comes the tone, the sweet stone rings when you knock the saint's open sarcophagus. Lady, in your ark of rock, you who wear the white stone as a wedding gown, lady, 
adamant and personal. We carry you in the eye's reliquary like a moat or like a beam that drowning we could cling to. Lady, stronger than time, stronger than light, we see you invisible and everywhere. And I'm going to finish with a sequence, which also is a kind of contemplation of one image. It's the, a carving of a manticore. Manticore is a fabulous medieval beast. I mean, not fabulous in the sense of wonderful, I mean, in the sense of invented. Um, half man, half beast, a bit like a centaur, actually. So man from the waist upwards. Um, this particular mantle, manticore is carved. It's a kind of huge, the size of a child, or say of a five-year-old child, um, graffiti car but carved into the uh, wall of a church at um, North Cerny, which is in the middle of England in Gloucestershire. And um, it's probably a medieval carving. And I was really interested in not only the, the beast and the kind of paganism and how it changes the church, but also in that line itself. I'm really interested in paths and indeed arcades and church aisles and, and, and excavated lines, which are a thing, which is an absence of a thing. So this is called line manticore. One. The line that is a creature scratched in stone is also a line of light lipping along the mineral edge of itself. Light shining from stone like flame from flint. The lion man shines and burns in the holy stone and blurred along the cuts meniscus like tears that absorb and spread brightness its mineral grain comes to light two come touch the cut and feel it open pale lips that were spread already so topple between change and nothing changing that immense blink of time in which we are falling so slowly we feel nothing the air full of birdsong come hold my hand so we can fall hand in hand together through the air as we breathe it three Nothing much except intention remains of whoever scratched a human beast into the wall where the church returns to itself, folding back a crucified arm, relinquishing the gesture, even as it throws it wide across the valley where our hidden creature likeness speaks only intermittently. Four. Wet stone smells of lost meaning, smells of mysterious wise intention, the unlived in stonework drawing back from us as if it had been vowed to a life apart from us. We can't witness such austere design, being fallen altogether into life together with this large white butterfly and so much sunlight. Five, small wonder warm sun fills the stone. This is not the first year nor the last. Sunlight will return sliding across the gutter, skipping the porch roof to fill the thirsty stone that changes color as heat gathers in it. Blood warm stone drawing a trace of oil from your finger when you touch its cut face. Six. The line that is a creature meets itself coming the other way. Mane, back and tail appear in turn then turn back into a single line scratching its way again 
and endlessly again through stone to make this marriage contract between man and beast who are one flesh, holy and fallen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for your engaging poems. Uh, with your permission, I would like to ask you a question. What's your favorite building? Your favorite building in terms of uh, its poetic metaphor or music metaphor. Thinking of this, this connection between music, architecture and poetry. Yes, and we were talking before we started, weren't we, about Goethe's um, description of architecture as frozen music. I'm very interested in, in obviously in music and poetry and in the way that abstract form, so form before denotation, before whatever the poem is going to say, um, or the music express, um, or indeed the building do. I'm really interested in proportion and golden sections and so on. But I think that I really, really love Romanesque churches. And actually, I really love um, the churches of, um, actually, I have to say, I really love Romanian Orthodox churches and the Orthodox churches of the, uh, the Balkans in general, because they are um, very sheltering and womb-like. There's a sense of, you know, if you were, religious, the sense of God coming down to earth to meet you, whereas the northern tradition is gothic and elevated and it actually has more affinities with, the, in a sense, with the mosque, with the kind of the radiant, the lifted up dome, the kind of sense of prayer ascending. Um, I mean, obviously, I, I, a building that lots of people love and I do is the, you know, the mosque at Cordoba, which has a cathedral inside it. I love, I love the forest of pillars. I mean, it's, it's not the forest of pillars I was thinking of in the nature of Gothic, because obviously it's not Gothic, but I love that sense that you could be lost among the stone columns. Um, then they are arcades, but they are arcades simultaneously going in both directions, aren't they? And it's, a, it's such a beautiful building. Wonderful thought. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Fiona. This was this was gorgeous. Um, I don't have a question, but I just want to comment on the um, the incredible syncretism in your poetry. Um, you know, man and beast, pagan and Christian, uh, man and God, is just you know it comes so naturally with your metaphors. Like this is the metaphor is the syncretism. You're bringing worlds together. So, um, and thank you so much for sharing this with us today. And yes, indeed, I mean, architecture is poetry, especially when, when you write poems about it. It's thank wonderful. you so much, Rula Maria. And actually, of course, I know that from, from actually from your social media posts, how interested you are in, in buildings and architecture. And we yeah. often see lovely, lovely photos posted by you. And I, yeah. I agree about syncretism. I think, you know, like anybody who's really interested in cultural exchange, I, it's not that I, I want there to be some sort of, you know, universal kind of mush, but I, I, I can't help but feel the way different mm, principles and forces and different discourses kind of come together and they move in and out of each other. And you can't, you can't sort of partition them. I, I am very excited by synthesis of all kinds. So thank you. And thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful. And uh, next up is Dr. Norbert Hirschhorn. Hello, let me see if I can, <laughs> searching for you here, right. Okay. So Dr. Norbert Hirschhorn is with us today uh, for the second time after a really lovely panel on the medical humanities, uh, which we had earlier this year in uh, September. Uh, Dr. Norbert Hirschhorn is a public health physician commended by President Bill Clinton as an American health hero and uh, proud to follow in the tradition of physician poets. Dr. Hirschhorn is one of the inventors and developers of the life-saving oral rehydration therapy for people suffering fluid loss from cholera and other infections, uh, diarrheal illnesses. Um, it is estimated that his work has saved around 50 million people suffering from dehydration. After two decades abroad, he now lives in Minneapolis, Minnesota, 
He has published six collections, the most recent, a bilingual Arabic-English co-translation with Syrian physician poet Fuad Fuad, Once Upon a Time in Aleppo. Uh, of the latter's poems, Hippocrates Press. So uh, if you would like to uh, know more about Dr. Hirschhorn's poetry, you could visit his website, www.birdspoet.com. So uh, Dr. Hirschhorn, it is a great honor to have you with us today and hear more of your lovely poetry. Thank you so much, Rula, for inviting me to this uh, august panel. And um, <clears throat> I should say my, my good wife is an architect and we often, I often show her the structure of my poems and, and she says, how is this built? And, and why is it this way and not that way? I'll start off with a poem about the pericardium, which, which is the lining around the heart. And it's from a poem in Arabic by Fuad Fuad, and we have co-translated it into English. The pericardium. I was born from a phantom called love, more nearly a ghost than a body. In the narrow alley between truth and illusion, I chose to be a membrane stuck to my lover, the heart, to let him detect the smell of a woman, to contain his ceaseless fatigue in my lap, rinsing him tenderly in my plentiful bath more nearly a specter than a body. Because I am shapeless, I was depicted on just one page of Gray's anatomy. My lover, the others, front and center. I don't care. Left in the margin of that page, I don't care. I've remodeled myself to take his shape, nourishing him in my vigilance. More nearly a spirit than a body. I see no other reason to exist but to cradle my love. And the poem was published in uh, issue number six of Indelible, the, the Feminine. Yep, that's the latest issue. <laughs> uh, a morning dove comes to call. Now, morning is M O U R N I N G because of the plaintive song of this dove. And it's a persona poem that is the speaker of the, of the poem is the dove itself. And I dedicate it to my father-in-law, age 98, um, who is in a care home in Duluth, Minnesota. A morning dove comes to call. His awning window opens just enough to scatter biscuit bits for me on the sill each morning my favorite Walker's pure butter shortbread. I watch him when I think he's not watching me. His room with a single bed, desk, wheelchair, television on, sound off, telephone, mute. Visitors, a woman to bathe him, one to give meds, another to deliver food on a tray, someone to dress him, trousers, rumpled shirt, a cardigan. He scribbles on a yellow pad, shuffles newspapers on the desk crowded with framed photographs, diplomas on the wall, painting of a hawk. There've been no crumbs for the past three days. Uh, all societies have rituals of burial, going back into the Neanderthals. Uh, the, the rituals in uh, my religion, Judaism, is called the Tahara, and it's administered by the uh, Society uh, for the Burial, the Tahara. He died at home, in bed, the old country. His family placed the body on a linen sheet on the floor, feet facing the door, covered it with a second linen. When body washers from the Hebra Kadisha arrived, they began the Tahara, purification. Bedclothes removed, chin bound up, the body rubbed down with lukewarm water, 
water poured over its head, water perfumed by attar of rose or myrtle, as was performed in ancient days. They recited from Ezekiel, I will sprinkle clean water on you, cleanse you from all your impurities. They testified to the beauties of the body, recounting from the Song of Songs, his head is burnished gold, his eyes like doves by rivers of milk and plenty. Hair combed, nails cleaned, nine measures of cold water poured on the body, dried with fleece, enshrouded by hand-sewn linen, pieces of pottery placed over eyes and mouth, the body laid in a plain pine box. The family kissed his head in reverence. Tahara, a gift to the bereaved, done. The body now ready for burial by sundown. On a lighter note, um, the linings around the brain uh, are called the dura mater and the pia mater. One is a thick one and one is a thin one. So I imagine these two linings, uh, one under the other, uh, are the mater sisters, dura and pia, one, dura mater. According to the Latin, I'm one tough mother. I must be. I'm the defender, the outer doberman of the brain. It makes me snarly having to share a bed with my little sister. Let me tell you, Pia's a goody two shoes, even if Vesalius dubbed her tender mother. Oh, she is limpid. Oh, she is delicate. With all those radiant red and blue vessels, her glistening surface reflecting light making everyone in the operating room go, ah. When the neurosurgeon operates, he barely notices me, just snip, snips on through. But how carefully, how touchingly, he fingers Pia on his way to the brain. Never mind, I do my job, I do it well. Two, Pia Mata. Of course I'm special. My sissy's just jealous, wrinkled old bully. And when she's supposed to be on guard, a teensy weensy hit to the head, emergency, emergency, subdural hematoma. I can't help it, I was born pretty. Never mind, I love my sister. And finally, heart sounds in three stanzas. One. From fetal life to my three score and ten, three billion beats and counting, brave mass of muscle no larger than my fist, uncomplaining day and night, no servant or slave so loyal, yet ruling me, its master, for without its fidelity my brain would turn to mush in minutes. Its meters are poetic, lupped up lupped up, lupped up in the ambic, knowing too when to pound out a lover's delight or to rush for a train, if ever in failure it can be saved, withering's dulcet foxglove or big farmer's angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. Two, there are days when heartache is more than grief, when spasm seizes the left side of my chest, making me hesitate to speak. Did it radiate or was that just a sore elbow? Or was I short of breath or hyperventilating? Those skip beats, oh dear, cardiac arrhythmia, maybe just a panic attack. I imagine the real event happening. Whom would I call? Where is my wife? Would I just sit on the front steps waiting for the ambulance to come? Passerby is staring. Can anyone do CPR? How embarrassing if the electrocardiogram was normal. Or would I prefer a real heart attack? I don't want to die. 
How would the guardian obituary read? If there is one, it hasn't happened yet. Three. 3 a.m., Boston City Hospital, yet another admission. Elderly black female obese, short of breath. I pushed aside her breast to auscultate her heart. Lupped up, lupped up, lupped. I woke with a start, my head on her chest, mortified. She simply smiled and said, that's all right, doctor. You needed your rest. I hear you calling, dear heart. Thank you. Wow, that was incredible. It's amazing how you make scenes of the, you know, the operating room and, and the hospital. You give them so much beauty. It's like you have a different eye. Um, I mean, how do you how do you see this? Like you don't really see things literally. You don't, I mean, you describe, for example, the red and the blue, the, the veins and the arteries, you describe them with so much beauty. Although, you know, usually people see them as gory things. Is it just because doctors are not afraid because they're used to it? They're, you know, desensitized in a way or do you eventually come to see it from an aesthetic point of view? Well, to tell the truth, I don't write very many medically oriented poems. And the ones that have, have written uh, tend to be sort of meta-medicine, if I may use that term. They're not about uh, my cancer, your radiation, et cetera, et cetera. And so they tend to be metaphoric in their very presence for something else, but, but mm -hmm. having to use the language of medicine and anatomy. Mm -hmm. So, and there's so much psychology also in your work. For example, uh, the one that you just read about the heart episode and all those racing thoughts, you capture them so well. The racing thoughts and then the feeling, you know, how embarrassing it would be if the, you know, the ECG would show normal heart rate. And then would you prefer to have a real heart attack instead? So this conversation with the self, those many selves that are, you know, at battle during a, a panic attack or a heart attack or whatever it is. And I just want to say that it was amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, next up, Elena, we have... Uh... Yes, thank you very much, Norbert. I'm pleased to introduce our next poet, Chan Yu, PhD, is an award-winning uh, bilingual English and Chinese poet, graphic novelist, scientist, and translator. She's the author of a memoir in verse called Little Green, Growing Up During the Chinese Cultural Revolution, published by Simon & Schuster winning multiple awards and a historical graphic novel in progress to be published by Macmillan and more. Her poetry and stories have been published or are forthcoming in the Boston Herald, Orion, Poetry Northwest, Aryan Press, MIT Tech Talk, Xinhua Daily, Poem of the Day, San Francisco Public Library, Heyday Books and more. Her work is taught in world history and culture classes in the US and internationally. Chen is an honorary of YBCA 100 award in 2020 for creative change makers. She has been awarded grants from San Francisco Arts Commission, Zellerbach, Poets and Writers, Sankofa Fund and more. She also holds a BS and MS from Peking University and a PhD from Rutgers University. She was a postdoctoral fellow in a Harvard MIT joint program. So I will now pass it on to you and your poems. Thank you for such an introduction. Now, long. <laughs> I know I submitted according to the to the word count <laughs> thank you so much such an honor to be here and uh, and uh, what fun to have so many interdisciplinary poets and uh, I, I you know the two previous poets uh, had such beautiful readings so I um, 
because I write bilingually, so I will share some shorter poems in both languages, and but one big long one, I will skip the Chinese part. So uh, this uh, first poem, I actually, when this, the story in the poem happened, I was uh, at the um, in Howard MIT joint program. Uh, it's a center for biomedical engineering. And one of the reason I went into science is because of my grandmother. And I shared my poetry in last event and, uh, for Indelible. And, and uh, I wrote so much about my grandmother because she, I, half of the time, me and my siblings were brought up by her. And she, when I was in, 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 in middle school, she broke her hips and uh, she had a metal pin in her hip. It was so painful, and uh, eventually I went to study biomaterials, bi degradable biomaterials, thinking I could replace that with a degradable one. But she she passed away when I was doing my research um, there. Um, so this poem came out of that story. It's called Alchemy. On a quiet lab bench, observing a microscopic miracle created in the human world, a failing cardiac muscle cell driven by a synthetic molecule revives beating at the rate of the heart, like the pulse of immortality carrying me beyond death. Stealthily, death suddenly caged my sight. On the other side of the earth, you left quietly. Organs, tissue, cells, no longer met metabolized. The new no longer superseded the old. The mind that once undulate for me returned to stillness. The heart that once beat for me returned to silence. In the silent world, I raised my eyes, heart and hands empty, open like vessels of alchemy as the ancient sorrow of parting, teardrops like silver mercury and the cold moonlight on a foreign land fill them up one by one. The Chinese version for you all and for my grandmother. Hope she can hear it. Liandan. In the quiet observatory,观察一个微小的人间造化,一颗衰竭的心机细胞,在一个合成分子的驱动下,复活,以新的频率, 起跳 已然休止，曾经为我跳动的心归于寂静，在寂静的世界里，我抬起眼睛，心和两手空空，如金丹化去的器皿，任古老的离愁随银般的泪滴和他乡的月光将他们。Thank you. And the next poem is called The Game of Bonding, a story of plastics. Because I am uh, trained as a polymer scientist and pla all plastics are polymers. So basically polymers are small molecules polymerized into uh, this bigger molecule and Often they are uh, when they are covalently bonded, 
they are not easily degradable, but I studied degradable polymers. I often call myself the, the good chemist. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, but I understand plastics, which is a huge problem now. And, and it's on my mind, on our mind every day, because we use it every day, we touch it every day. It's in the blood, in our bloodstreams now. And the new, newest reports say, it, and it's on the Himalayas. And, and it's also detected in the deepest ocean. So what do we do? Shall we blame the polymer, blame the plastics, or do we have something to do with it? So the game of bonding, a story of plastics. What are plastics but the same elements that make up you and me? Hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, what are they but like us of life longing to come into forms and the beings that can be seen, touched, used, and appreciated through bondings, bondings sometimes too intimate, covalent, and long lasting according to our ever so particular human needs. Nature made or human made can both sustain or destroy lives. But in essence, as matter, there's no increase, no decrease, no creation, no elimination as the Heart Sutra says. And as the physical law reveals, thus no liking nor hating shall be applied towards the same matter as you and me. The human curious child of nature discovers a small secret, designs a game and plays it too far. Now we have waves waves that are human made of plastics, of covalent bondings coming into being for a few seconds or hours or days or years of usage, then discarded to form waves of sheets, chunks, chips, fibers, beads, and particles of waste, waste of covalent bondings on top of, of the land, on bottom of the ocean, in the air we breathe, in the water we drink, in a small bird's stomach, in a young mother's breasts, in a cell's nanometer memory, in a surfer's giant waves. We are nature's failed students, punished by our mistake of not being able to learn the total truth before trying our hands on alchemy. Because we thought and think we can because we sold our soul to the devil who says, yes, yes, you can, without mentioning the consequence of our actions. The devil is nothing but the partial truth, which is what we know and always insist as total truth. What we make, what makes anything evil often is our inability to bear the consequences. Yet in nature's time, God's eyes, everything is degradable, including the consequence itself. Buddha says, all things are emptiness. They are without defining characteristics. They are not born. They do not cease. They, not, they are not defiled. They are not undefiled. They have no increase. They have no decrease. Jesus says, love your enemy. Your enemy is yourself. Lao Tzu says, all is one. The plastic 
Plastic is you. You are the plastic. We must all bond, degrade, rebond, and redegrade into and oh, and away from each other at a rate mutually acceptable, with an understanding of consequences and our ab abilities to bear them. Then we can say to each other, "I am sorry. I apologize." I thank you and I love you. Thank you. So I will skip the Chinese version for this. I do have it in front of myself. And the last um, poem I'm going to share is very short, and I will do both versions. The, this poem is called The Poem to Be. The Poem to Be is an unmatchable, omnipotent molecule about to be synthesized. Is a gene chancing a mutation to cross the dragon gate. Is an ovum egg cultivating the self for immortality. Is an almost inhabitable planet in a far interstellar space is a cloud of worlds gathering and dispersing in the primordial chaos is the unfathomable light of dreams golden azus Hurtunda 是梦想金丹的飘渺之光。Thank you. That will be it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're, I think I speak for everyone. We're utterly impressed with the imagery you have created. Uh, do you translate your own poems? Or yes, have you had I your do. Poems? Translated by someone else, by no, I never, never anybody else. Uh, because mm. I, I know how hard translation is. I would not torture other people to do it. <laughs> and uh, I do write poetry in both languages, so it's very hard to predict which language I will write a, a poem. It could be English or it could be Chinese, and it could be like back and forth. And mm -hmm. so, so it's a very uh, personal. Uh, <laughs> process <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh, so i haven't asked anybody else to to do that i mean between english and chinese but uh, i have other people translate into french and uh, and uh, spanish which i i i don't know i, I mean i i, I don't speak uh, mm -hmm. so <laughs> but do you think by translating a poem it becomes something else it, turns uh, it is, yeah, it is, uh, especially uh, Chinese is such a different language um, from um, any Western language. Uh, so it, it, the way it looks, it, it pronounced, pro pronounce, and the image it draws in with every character. So, so yeah, it is a very, uh, I mean, every time I, uh, start with no confidence <laughs> for any poem. I'm like, I don't think I can do this, but but somehow after a while it still works, and so I just keep on doing that. And and uh, and for some poem, some poems I, for 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 even for years I won't touch it. I said that's just absolutely impossible. Then one day I somehow I gather myself, and sometimes I still manage to do it. Yeah. And, and nowadays, also the journals and many journals uh, actually they are happy to publish uh, bilingual poetry. Um, mm -hmm. And and the first poem I read is going to be published by 
uh, Poetry Northwest. Um, they're gonna, they have a translation um, and you know, um, issue in, in summer, they will feature, I have a project called Two Languages, One Community. And I work with um, my co-founder of the project is poet Michael Wall. And we connect Chinese American and African American communities with, you know, with poetry writing and translation. So, so our project is going to be featured. And um, we have amazing poets collaborating with us, including Maxine Hongkinson, L. Yang, and and um, you know, we are reaching out to more poets. Yeah, and Alpha Weaver, Jenny Lim. Yeah, you guys might know some of them. Yeah. That's fascinating. <laughs> fascinating. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, Rob. Um, I just want to say this was brilliant and very incredibly arresting, as usual, Chen Yu. Thank you so much. And you remind me a lot of, of what Richard Dawkins said about poetry and science, saying that science is the poetry of life. And I think you demonstrate this beautifully. And thank, thank you so much for doing that. And that is the best bridge between the arts and sciences, you know, to demonstrate science through your poetry and vice versa. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for this great um, opportunity yeah, to be with so many wonderful, great poets. It's a great yeah. honor. It's a great honor. <laughs> and um, next we move to another branch of science, psychology and psychotherapy with Hélène. Hello, Hélène. Hélène is joining us from maybe the only part of the UK where it didn't snow yesterday, right? Maybe. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So Ellen, um, welcome aboard. And um, Ellen uh, also has uh, her poems with us in uh, the latest issue of Indelible. Ellen Demetriadis won the Hedgehog Press Full Fat Poetry Collection competition in 2020, and will have her debut collection, The Plum Line, published sometime soon. Um, she has been published in numerous poetry magazines, anthologies, and webzines. In 2021, she was highly commended in the International Poetry on the Lake Competition and was shortlisted in the Wells Open Poetry Competition. She was once an actress, but has now worked as a transpersonal psychotherapist for the last 25 years and lives in South Devon with her husband and daughter. So without further ado, Helen, I invite you to read some of your wonderful poetry. Thank you so much, Rula. It's, um... A real honor to be here among um, wonderful poets and, um, and audience. Um, so I tried to choose a small collection of poems here that, that resonate in some way with the theme of psychotherapy. So uh, the first poem I was touching up today, so it's very fresh. Um, and maybe just one thing to say is that uh, on my father's side of the family, um, they are all Greeks or were Greeks uh, from Asia Minor, um, which is now modern day Turkey. And uh, at that time, there was a rich uh, mixture of, of different ethnic minorities, including Greeks and, of course, Armenians. The Bell. Once you rang across an almond blossomed land, soft, tough fairy chimneys, underground cities. Then your kind were purged from Cappadocia. I was a pilgrim searching for my roots. A Turkish vendor picked you out from his Aladdin's cave, rang several Armenian bells. I chose you for your song. Your rounded, solid shoulders, your waist and lip, fill my palm, give it weight. My middle finger lines your neck, my index curves into the worn brass dimple on your handle. Now your tongue is mostly silent, holding counsel on the window ledge, while people come in and out of my consulting room, searching for home, their lost song. Um, now, my next poem 
came about, the reason I've chosen it is that it came about in a supervision session. What I mean is um, I was exploring my work with a client in supervision and uh, I was reminded of some feelings um, from my past. My funny Valentine. Although you chase me up the stairs laughing and tickle me as I hide behind my door frightened, your hand up my nightdress, and you send me a valentine of a man baby holding a heart over his genitals and he's blushing and the card is saying, if you can't be good, be mine. And although you visit me years later and we're admiring the roses in Greenwich Park and the bees on the flowers and you're saying, be careful, they're going to pollinate you. And in the back of the cab, you tease me. The driver will think I'm your beau. Although, excuse me, you're 80, you are my father. Mm. And um, this is another one uh, about me and my father. And I've chosen it really for the title because um, this is what people explore in psychotherapy. Familial intimacy. We are chugging to your death on the panting rhythm of your breath. I crush lavender buds under your nose. You open your mouth like a baby bird. You sleep with eyes wide, gaze turned in. I see into depths without being checked. On day three, your eyes break the surface. Your lips are moving, I lean in. You're hopeless, you hiss. You are the death adder, Akanthophis. I flee your bedside. You slip back into your body's fevered decoupling. And the next few I've chosen are actually um, mostly based on, on dreams. I have a passion for dreams and I've kept a dream journal for many years. And I love it if um, or when clients bring me their dreams so that we can work on them together because dreams have such a deep intelligence uh, to communicate to us. But, um, you know, I feel, well, I am a novice anyway, but to kind of bring uh, the dream world, uh, specific night dreams into poems is, is quite a challenge because they're not necessarily easy to understand for the reader or the audience. So, um, this first one I'm going to read is a mixture of a real life walk I went on with a friend that then catalyzed a, a dream that night, which then reminded me of an exercise I did on my psychotherapy training over 25 years ago. Um, and it was an exercise in which we had to do something while our eyes were closed. Mucky fingers. A daffodil wilts at my feet. I scrape my fingers into the loam, resettle it in the riverbank. At twilight, two children crouch over a fish. It flaps on the path. There! The little girl points to a hole in its flank. The boy digs into the wound, scrapes at the scales, puts his mouth to the hole, bites and sucks the life from the fish. Darkness a fruit in my hands. My fingers jab into the peel, pluck at the pith, dismember the body, toss it away. The juice on my hands is acid grief. Mm. And um, this one uh, is partly a dream that came from a kind of felt sense memory in my body that promoted a dream which then in turn uh, brought back another memory to me. Small creatures. How a newt padded through the cracks of my cupped fingers last night, no longer water bound by feathery gills. How I tried to contain the pale brown of him, offered him ruffled greenery. How his intestines lit up my dreams, an electric blue and green. Like Sir Isaac Newton, that other newt named by my mother, 
how he hatched from an egg I brought home in a jar, ate the mosquito squigglers I caught from a pond, how he hung motionless in the water, eyes protruding then pounced, how I sheltered from my father, my arm across my face, shoulders reaching my earlobes, knees bent. And then lastly, um, I'm, I'm afraid it's another dream poem. Um, it's a couple of dreams put together from many, many years ago uh, during my psychotherapy training. Um, but of course, I was able to go back to them because they're all written down. And I chose it because the title is called Breaking the Enchantment. That's what the poem's about. And of course, in psychotherapy, many enchantments and trances <laughs> are broken. To, to bring us more freedom. Breaking the enchantment, driving through a moonless night, mandarin pieces scattered on my lap, brambles rip at the windscreen. I've got to get back to mummy before the clock strikes. Mum's freshly painted canvas is propped against a garden bench. A butterfly hovers over, wings orange like her hair. They glue down in an oily flower. I jump out of the car. The butterfly is struggling. Wings tear from the thorax. A grasshopper vaults out of the tableau. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Alain. This, is, this has been surreal. A surreal journey into dreams, into the unconscious, into childhood, roots, memory, ancestry. It's brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. It's a pleasure. Thank you. And uh, next, last but certainly uh, not least. Anna. Yes, uh, I am uh, delighted to introduce our already final guest. Uh, Loretta C. Luzajic is an artist, writer, educator, and editor living in Toronto, Canada. She earned her degree in journalism at Ryerson University, but is a lifelong student of her passion, art history. She writes stories and poetry inspired by art and has published widely in journals around the world. Her two most recent books are Pretty Time Machine and Winter in June. Both collections of ekthrastic prose poems and other small stories. Lorette has been nominated for Best Microfiction, Best Small Fictions, and four times each for Best of the Net and the Pushcart Prize. She's the founder and editor of the Ekthrastic Review, the flagship journal of ekthrastic literature. She teaches writing, art appreciation through the journal and other organizations. She's also an internationally collected visual artist with clients in 30 countries so far. So, Lorette, I will hand it over to you now. Um, thank you so much for that uh, lovely introduction. And thank you, uh, Rula, for having me here. It's really such an honor to be among such incredible writers and thinkers. So um, thank you for that. So most of the poetry that I write is ekphrastic. It's inspired by visual art and um, it tends to work two ways. One, it's kind of uh, free writing in that the painting pushes me into an unexpected place. And um, the other way is that I write about the art or the artists. So I have, um, a selection here that crosses both of those. And I'm going to share the screen um, so that you can see the uh, paintings that I'm reading uh, from. Is that showing? Okay, great, thank you. So this poem is called Blood and it was inspired by this painting by Theodore Chasseriot of France. The sisters, light and dark, rain and shine, 
Corrine, blunt cut, burnt sienna, and poems about midnight. Dawn, wavy and feathered, as blonde and buoyant as the day's first glow. The scent of cinnamon and oranges. Corrine would wander into the woods for solitude, spend all of Saturday in the library to avoid birthday parties and team sports. Dawn was a magnet, a hub, warm, loved everyone, stacked up a few dozen Valentines every winter. One sister does gold highlights, pastel blouses, a quick peach gloss over lids and mouth. The other has lips like a cardinal and holes everywhere for hardware. Dawn is married to her teenage sweetheart, takes her three flaxen trust boys to a big box church with drums and hands lifted in the air. Corinne was an atheist for a long time and is usually still wasted on Sunday mornings. She has no children and her husband is dead. Today, Dawn is flipping flapjacks for a choir, still in Capri pajamas. Corinne rinses the blueberries, slices up bananas. Dawn does not understand her sister's painting, but even so, her room is covered in them. Corinne does not understand new country, but she is bobbing along to the heartache as she drizzles the pancakes in nutmeg and maple. It was an impossible promise to never be divided, but they have kept it since tween age pinky swear. They are refuge and sanctuary. You'll never be friends, mother used to say in that trademark sing song taunt of hers, because your father's traitor juice runs through your veins. And they both saw right through it then and there, knew that his blood was the glue. This is a painting by um, my fellow Canadian, Maud Lewis. And the poem is called Paintings Sold Here. She bore the brutal East Coast winters in her bones, shriveled small, a child's casket was enough to hold her when she was through with everything. The pain held her from the first to the last, kept her caged in a one room shack with a big wood stove. She painted postcards, cheerful folksy bric-a-brac, bright birds and bells for oxen, lively colors to keep the bleaker agonies at bay. Sometimes someone would knock, pick out a card to take back west with them, push a crumpled five spot into the empty tobacco tin. Her husband couldn't read, but he could count. No one liked him, and even after he was murdered for that tin of small bills, her gone already, they would keep on talking about him, call him mean. Maybe, but maybe she was not all sugar herself, and here she was safe, and he cared for her in his own way, even after the girl came, saying Maud was her mother. She was too lame to bear babies. The only one she'd made had been born dead. Her parents told her so before wrapping that oh so little life in blue cotton and passing her off to an orphanage so they would not be shamed or stuck with more mouths that needed feeding. All of it hurt, the aching hell of a body and antibodies that turned on her before she could talk. The boy she had loved and made love to before he up and marched into the sunset without her, the ugly face she saw in the broken glass, the way Everett struggled to keep the fire stoked the grinding poverty, the lonely stretch of days and seasons, the isolation. If anyone had asked her about any of it, she didn't have any sweet words of wisdom about the good Lord's blessings or the joy of simplicity in nature. She had only the paper and the brush, the way she could make them work, the magic way that apples and kitty cats appeared, this and the long dark overhead, the miles of spilling stars. And the last poem here is after Seraphine Lewis, who was an uh, artist in France um, in the early 40s. She painted what the angels she was named for told her to, cosmic light show, dazzling bejeweled foliage, wide eyes, what she saw when she closed hers. Paradise followed her glittering with shards of light like stained glass. 
Perhaps the glowing irises peering between petals were her mother's. She could not be sure since she could not remember her face. She was still nursing when her mother left this plane. Seraphine's own breasts had not yet bloomed when she was took to the pastures, cajoling lambs with her shepherd's crook and the sad smile of a girl already orphaned for years. The lambs knew, they followed her to keep her company. She loved the soothing mule and rhythm of their bleating. It was after in the convent she cleaned that she started to record the lush patterns that surrounded her. When her hand stung from the lie she used to soak the sister's habit, the pictures of the saints provided comfort. She knew she belonged to Mary as much as did the nuns. She was the virgin's daughter and her bride. Seraphine in secrecy covered by darkness, mixed tinctures and pigments from the bounty of the world around her. She never told a soul how she conjured color and no one knows now. The angels sang to her when she worked, just as they appeared to the other shepherds on that extraordinary eventide in Bethlehem. One day their trumpets ceased to sound. Seraphine laid all her brushes down. She would never paint again. It is finished, she said to the starry night. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lorette. That was brilliant. Thank you so much, Lorette. Um, thinking of your, uh, your art, the collages inspired from art, history, music, poetry, religion, travel. I cannot help wondering, um, are your poems visual? Do you organize words on paper the same way you put together images in your paintings? Most often I write prose poetry, which will um, kind of be in paragraph blocks. Um, so, as far as the words themselves go, I would say no, but you're right that the collages I make, whether with words or with paint, um, it's the same. I just have this smorgasbord of assorted details that whether I collect them in images in my mind or on actual paper, um, they come together in that way. Mm. See, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lorette. Um, I don't know which is more colorful, the painting itself or your poetry. I mean, it's just uh, amazing how much you reflect the brightness and the stories that are um, in every painting. Okay, so I want to thank you all, everyone, uh, for your wonderful, wonderful poetry readings. And it's such a beautiful, collage of science and technology and medicine and psychology and painting and architecture. Thank you for bringing poetry closer to our everyday lives and to everything that we see around us. Um, we're gonna have a QA and a session. I'm sure the audience has so many questions. We've already had some in the chat box, uh, but let's take a five minute screen break. If you would wanna go take a little stretch, um, fill up your cup of tea or coffee, uh, and we'll be back at, it's going to be 8.30 Dubai time. So it's something 30 wherever you all are. <laughs> Thank you. Um. Okay, I have my screen on uh, gallery view, so you also might want to set it on gallery view. That would make it more like a round table discussion-ish <laughs> type of format. We could all see each other that way. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I see Mohammad already has a question for our poet. Mm -hmm. Okay. So maybe we should start. All right, let's do that, Elena. All right. So Mohammad is asking, what do most well-written poems have in common? Is it for anyone specifically, Mohammed, or is it um, in general? I guess it's for everyone. I think so, yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, yeah, Mohammed you know, says it's. Would you like to break the ice, please? Fiona, Dr. Sampson? Yes. Um... I mean, it's uh, how long is a piece of string question, isn't it? It's a lovely question. It's a question that poets and readers of poetry ask themselves repeatedly. I think uh, probably one way to answer it is to is to sidestep and um, ask oneself what one enjoys about poetry, what one values in poetry, and to think perhaps to follow that impulse, to use it as a compass to look for poems that are going to speak to you and rather than sort of worrying about are you sure they have passed some kind of set of criteria because poetry is um it's not actually that poetry is a universal language but it is a universal practice i mean there's been poetry in every language and culture in every time and those poems take enormously different forms from each other and have enormously different purposes actually so i mean to the point where it is quite hard really if you think think of everything from Gilgamesh to kind of postmodern New York school to say what what makes a poem in, in a sort of total way so maybe it's better to follow one's desires into poetry and use that as a criterion the, the famous critic um, Harold uh, Bloom said that uh, poems should surprise and delight and, and by delight not meaning ha ha delight but it's a sort of a there's a sort of epiphanic understanding as as the as you go through the the lines of the poem, but the surprise part is is to keep the reader always wondering where it's, the poem is going. The the poet says, uh, "Trust me, I don't know where it's going, but just trust me that it'll it'll all come out." If I may, I'm reminded of taking a photography class. Um, and the question was, what makes a good photo? And the answers that were given were all about um, having this great camera or having a very artistic eye and um, or a technical mastery. And the teacher's answer was, it should be interesting. And he left it there. And that stayed with me for many years um, because there's so many kinds of expression or even sometimes something might not have as much technical prowess, but um, other times it does, but it's lacking something. And I think that's a kind of a good barometer. If it's interesting, um, it surprises and delights if it's interesting. Um, as the the bloom was just mentioned so yeah great question I, may i add something i i think from a writer's uh, perspective um I, I want to talk about this it's like i always sense something there's something somewhere it's a feeling from an image or a story you heard maybe even months ago from the news or something that oh you know something from your past you just keep on coming back so it's almost like mining you think there is something there you can dig into or in china we have a culture of jade right so you don't know where sometimes it's it's very blind you have this piece of stone there might be pressed jade precious jade inside but you don't know you blindly trust it and then you open and there it is oh maybe there isn't it's not and 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 so so that's just one example and, and sometimes you just sit with something 
for half a day or even for days, all of a sudden something jumps out. And there is a very clear moment for me um, for writing a poem. There, normally there are a line or two all of a sudden emerged and, and everything changes and it all, it all came together. And so, so that there is a very, there is a moment and it's almost scientific. Um, it's almost science when everything falls together. Yeah, I, I think maybe all of you have these kind of moments, yeah. Otherwise, sometimes it's just, it's just not there, you have to give up. And, and, and but you, if you just keep digging, maybe you will be lucky. <laughs> Sort of like the Michelangelo in the stone. It's yeah. There. Yeah, you need to get it out. Yeah. And sometimes, honestly, and there were quite a few times, I have two really incredible sentences and there's just two lines and all of a sudden the whole poem will come together because of something that I did not know what. All of a sudden that these two lines fit into that. And everything came. <laughs> it's it's really fun. Yeah, it's very mysterious. Then we have Thank another you. question. Sorry. Go ahead, Diana. Yeah. Thank you. We have another question coming from Miriam. Thank you, Elena. First of all, I would like to, to tell you that it is a privilege for me to be among you and among um, such great and contemporary poets. Um, I was wondering uh, uh, whether uh, Fiona's uh, predilection for medieval uh, architecture, uh, as well as uh, Norbert and um, Helen's uh, uh, fondness for classicism, uh, um, denotes their desire to restore the past or uh, at least uh, an, an attempt to uh, preserve it. And in, uh, in Fiona's uh, case, uh, do you think that the architectural uh, imagery, uh, which is scattered in your uh, poems, uh, uh, may also symbolize uh, uh, England's uh, uh, cultural uh, heritage? And um, and do you think that uh, this the, the struggle for its um, um, spiritual uh, possession um, um, recalls the uh, symbolic struggle? Uh, 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 for um, uh, you, you mentioned uh, Ruskin, but I would like to recall Howard Sand by uh, Foster. Gosh, what a really interesting question. Well, I'll I'll, I, I'll go first then, shall I? Since since I you, since I was sort of first thank to read. Um, thank you for that question. Um, I think several things are going on when I'm writing about architecture. One is. Um, as we were saying before, I'm really interested in continuity. So I'm really interested in, and I'm really interested in the retrieval of what's lost. So, and traces of culture. I'm really interested and excited them in, in other cultures than my native culture, but my native culture is where I can do my work because I mean, I have a whole practice around translation and cultural translation, but in terms of um, my own writing, I can't steal someone else's experience. I have to, to write from mine. I think it's really, it's incredibly privileged, but incredibly problematic to be a British writer um, because of our history. You know, our history is not a good history. We have an imperial history. Um, we also have a history of not having been invaded for, a mill for one millennium. So there is a kind of danger around complacency. At the same time, we are also a culture which is submerged under the North American, um, you know, for most people. So I think that most people who are living in Britain at the moment, whether they are first generation Britons or whether they are 17th generation Britons um, are sort of denied access to the roots of, of living in this particular spot. And, you know, every environment, almost every single environment, including even the Amazon nowadays is, is man-made, is being, there's a dialectic between the human and the natural, something I'm very interested in. Uh, in my environmental interests are all to do with the inhabited landscape and, you know, the way we are actually formed by the countryside around us, but we also form it because I've been living in the countryside for the last quarter century. Um, 
So in that case, that environment is not innocent. <clears throat> well, so what's there? So there's that, there's all of that. And then there is a quite personal thing, which is I take profound aesthetic pleasure in buildings in space and three dimensionality and always have, and that's purely personal, but it means it's how my imaginary works. And then there was another thing, which is that um, uh, this book come down was, is, is actually a book about the search to belong, because although I'm British on my mother's side, I'm not on the other side. And um, I was a foundling. And so I didn't know my family growing up. And so there's a whole loads, loads and loads of issues about identity and where I belong. And the kind of idea that I might belong in an imagined space um, where my father's fault was from, uh, somewhere I've never been, but I also belong in a literal way, but not a historical way where I've been living because it's somewhere I don't have any ancestors. I've only been there for five years. In fact, actually, I've just moved house and there's Rula Marie and as I'm living in a, <clears throat> well, we're living in an Airbnb and all my books are in boxes and um, uh, because we're in the middle of how complicated house move. So, so finding your place and elegies for dead members of my not family and my actual family and so on are are the ghosts that inform the landscape of that book, which was the only book I had with me, and therefore the book I was reading, and therefore the book that had more about geophysical space in it. Long answer. Wow. I like the uh, term Fiona imagines space because much of my writing is interiority, which is to say not um, architecture above the ground, but architecture below the ground. And what happens below the ground is as every bit as interesting and compelling and mysterious as above. And you don't know where it's going. And, and it, it's based on, you know, my experiences in life, of course, but, they, but not explicitly. It, it, it has a, a, a tone, an emotional feel to it, but not very much in terms of explicit uh, detail. The unconscious is structured like a language, but I also think it's structured like a building. And we think when you dream about a building, when you dream about a house, you dream about your own body and your own life and your own sight. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Hamad also has a question for all the poets. How do your poems develop? One word at a time. <laughs> there was a poet who said, um, "Would you give your Would you give your up your soul for the world's best poem ever?" Well, you say, "Well, maybe." You know. uh, would you give up your soul for the best line in the in in the world ever? Well, I don't know. Would you give up your soul for the best single word in a poem. And I keep looking for that best single word. Uh -huh. Well, maybe that's I how think... it is I mean, scientifically, the building blocks of life. Words are the building blocks of poems and hence that's how they build one word at a time. Uh, I can see that Chen wants to say, is ready to say something. Um, I think for every, every poem is different. For, for example, the one, the, the poem about the game of bounding, the story of plastics, actually it came out in 20 minutes. It's a huge long poem, but I studied polymer <laughs> science for years and I did not know that was gonna come out. And all of a sudden one day it did. It was in Maxine Hong Kingston's uh, veteran writers group and, and that it's, a a very special group. Every time I go there, something special came out and, and it just suddenly happened. It literally happened in 20 minutes. And, and of course I edited, but some poems, even maybe it's just six sentences and it takes many days. And it's just, you know, it, it will happen when it, it wants to happen. You have to respect it. Yeah. But, but of course, there are two main ways, aren't there, that a lot of poets write. Poets either tend to write um, brick by brick, or mm -hmm. they're the sort of Elizabeth Bishop poet who writes and has the words, words in air, words hanging in air, the poem which has spaces, it's a scaffolding. 
um, so there's a skeleton or there's a brick by brick and um, neither's right or wrong there. And you might do different things at different points in your life. It's like uh, Chun, um, well, actually, it's probably very few of my poems just they come from an impulse. So actually, the, the funny Valentine that just came in one, you know, in about five minutes. And another a death poem uh, uh, about uh, my father's death, um, which was on the, the Wells shortlist that came in just I didn't even know it was going to come, you know, my husband and daughter we're going to the, this little sailing club down the road. And, oh, are you coming? Are you coming? I was going, no, I, I don't feel like it. I'm just going to hang around here. And I hadn't realised it was a, an, the anniversary of my father's death. And then I just sat on the decking and then suddenly the poem just manifested. But a lot of my poems, I, you know, I, I have a love of editing, actually. Well, I've developed a love of editing and I go back and I go back and I go back. So there's another death one of his that's a, um, it's a, long, a longer one. And I still don't feel it's quite right, sort of nearly four years down the line. Um, but I love the, the crafting, the going back and getting it. I want to get it just right. <laughs> then I can rest. <laughs> and it's never really finished, is it? Unless you just decide to stop. Mm. For myself, I tend to collect um, snippets of interesting material or words and phrases or impressions. Um, and I jot them down in millions of little notebooks and um, pieces, post-it notes, this kind of thing. And um, in interesting stories that I hear, or if I'm learning about an artist, something will strike me and eventually um, I'll have another inspiration and it will connect with some of these pieces. And so in a sense, I'm working on a hundred poems at a time or, mm -hmm. or, or more. One might suddenly have a larger um, sense happen to it. And then I'll be like, oh, I've got these snippets. And, you know, so they're, they're, they're building together over years. And then I'll give a little bit of time and it will come together. Hmm. I have a question for Helen. I was curious to know uh, whether her uh, uh, funny Valentine, sh so sh should we interpret your uh, funny Valentine as a, a, a single uh, sensory uh, stimulus, uh, which can, uh, uh, trigger an um, array of uh, associations, uh, memories, and uh, um, synesthetic images? Well, it, it was written, um, it actually came from, from a workshop um, where the, the, the exercise was um, about swerve, swerve poetry. So a poem that suddenly swerves at the end. And um, so it began for me with the word, although, you know, as an, although this and although this and although this and all of this. So it, it um, I mean, it was a true story. Um, the images are, are you know what I experienced and then the shock at the end is although all these things you are my father so um I, I'm, I'm not completely sure I've understood your your question Miriam but it it uh you know the poem was one sentence really and um uh you know, I was simply quoting, mentioning Bachelard, no, who um, tells us that a whiff of perfume or music or whatever you like, in, yeah. in case you're funny Valentine, no? Um, he tells us that uh, um, even the, 
the slightest order can or image um, can create an entire environment in the, oh, yes. in the world yes. of imagination and yes. And so, um, because perception uh, stimulates the imagination, uh, so consciousness uh, itself is uh, productive, no? So, and uh, um, productive of being uh, um, as incessant um, birthing of newness uh, through images. Uh, so, it, I was wondering whether you were following uh, <laughs> this pattern <laughs> not consciously it, it literally just came out um drawing on um images and memories um it, it, it was an emotional kind of impulse to to i suppose get something out in a way and uh with a with a certain punch to it um and honestly it I wrote it in about five minutes. <laughs> it just all, it, 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 it was kind of ready to, to birth. So I didn't, I didn't, um, uh, the, 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 the craft in it, if you like, came from the, the sentence structure, starting with, although, you know, uh, as a kind of argument, although this, this, so it, it, I wanted to shock it, you know, I, I wanted there to be a, a, I wanted the swerve to, to work really well as a swerve. Uh, but it, 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 in that instance, it was, it was easy for me. <laughs> um, I, I guess there was um, years, uh, it was, it was uh, an experience that had been uh, sitting with me for many years, if you like. So it was ready to pop out when it popped out. <laughs> I mean, I hadn't thought about it beforehand. I didn't know it, it, you know, it came when it came. It visited me when it visited me. It wasn't like it was festering, oh, I've got to get this out. It just, through a partic particular work I was doing with a client, there was a particular atmosphere that kind of uh, recharged some of this old material. Uh, and, that, and then it freed it out, it freed it up, it, it, it um, yeah. But uh, I, I, I didn't spend a long time crafting it. <laughs> it's amazing how sometimes they just dawn upon you, you know? Sometimes a poem kind of comes knocking at your door and uh, yes. all you need to do is just answer. And other times, if you keep a notebook and then you kind of find the time to, to stitch together some ideas and, you know, save some metaphors. It's just, yeah, I mean, as, as Fiona said earlier, there are two ways of writing a poem. It's either this or that, usually. So, and it's nice when they surprise you with their existence like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, I like that, what you say there. Yes, they, they have their own existence. It's like mm -hmm. they have existences of their own. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, any anyone else would like to ask a question using the mic? Or Elena, do we still have in the chat box? Oh, we have plenty of questions, but I uh -oh. have a feeling that Raymond has wanted to say a few words for some time. Okay, Raymond. Raymond? Oh, I, I, I didn't know what the format was, so I just asked, you know, can anyone participate or or we answering questions? But uh, I write poetry also, and uh, I guess maybe uh, what Helene said about uh, the swer the swerve or whatever. I think I think uh, in my own case, um, it's like a it's like a gymnastic performance, and you see on the uneven parallel bars, and they go through all this incredible gymnastics, but right at the end, you have to stick the landing. And I think about the last line of a poem, a teacher I had once told me um, that writing a poem is like telling a joke and you have to have a, a good punchline or else the joke is not very effective. So, so that was the one thing. And the, the only other thing I wanted to say is what makes a good poem? And I would say goosebumps. And uh, the same teacher mentioned 
no emotion in the writer, no emotion in the reader. So I just wanted to mention those two things. That's all. And, and what a wonderful reading. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Raymond. Um, Mohammed has another question, this time for Norbert. How did you manage to fit writing in with other demands on your time? Oh, what a good question. Um, as, as Wordsworth said, the world is too much with us. And uh, what, I, what I can do the best is what Lorette does, is to scribble down words, lines, notes. I call it the boneyard, like a dog buries a bone and knows where to find it when, it, when it's needed. Uh, and, and some of the lines sometimes come together. Sometimes an old poem will supply, an old poem that's not any good will supply a very good line. And you, so you steal from yourself. And um, I wish I had more time. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so I guess uh, we are ready to close the session today. Uh, All right, and then. If I may ask a question, please, please do, Lena. <laughs> thinking yeah. of uh, the uh, interdisciplinary nature of uh, poetry, thinking of poetry being as complex as life itself and of science, music, all the other aspects of life and their complexity. I would like to ask all our distinguished guests, uh, do you think poetry is a way of raising awareness on um, what's happening in the world? And on the other hand, do you think poetry validates by making different, um, by focusing on different aspects, like for instance, Thank you, Chun. I never thought that that degradable polymers could be part of a poem. Mm -hmm. So do you think that poetry connected with other disciplines not only raises awareness on different aspects of life or science or music or architecture, but also validates the results, let's say, of scientific research, for example? makes them more accessible to the public by putting them into simple words. Yeah, I, I think in science, that's very important. Um, how do you make the general public understand in, in simple words, understand what's happening in your research or your development of technology? That's, that's a really valued skill. Mm -hmm. um, I think many of you can confirm that I think poetry um, should bring awareness and, and, and it should also confirm the human effort that has been made in the many fields we, we touched. And although it's, it's a struggle as we face such quick development and often without looking at the consequences of our development, we just raced forward and there now we have to bear the consequences. And, and that's, I think that's a huge, huge thing for human beings. And, and, and for thousands of years, the nature environment didn't change. Even we have wars and, and nature, natural disasters, somehow the world of nature was something we, we trusted we can return to. But now that whole landscape has been altered, changed, and by our modern technology and, and our own desires to, 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 to move forward so fast, to, to get so much. Yeah, I, I think it, it, it is huge. There's just so much there. I mean, that is the thing we are facing today inevitably I mean look at everything like everything we wear right has plastics or synthetic materials and we benefit from it but where would they go if they don't degrade <laughs> and every piece of plastic like plastic bags and I mean it's it's just there's no escape yeah 
Mm. I, I think poetry is so powerful. And because I grew up in China, we have such a deep uh, tradition of poetry. And in our history, poetry ha is, is of life and death. Or, you know, some, some emperor lose his kingdom. Some poet emperor can lose his kingdom because he wrote about his lost country or something. It, it is, you know, of, of huge, I mean, it can unite people. You can break people apart. And, and, and as we, in the recent war happening in Ukraine, you can see this happening and, and language at its highest level is poetry, even for politicians. Mm. <laughs> right? It is poetry when they when when a, a, a politician master the power of the language, he or she will move the world. And it, it is extremely powerful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Wow. And uh, Chun, um, just to comment quickly on uh, what you mentioned about the environment and the changing landscape and um, the changing nature of nature, uh, we have a panel, uh, a poetry panel dedicated to this on Monday, uh, an eco poetics oh. panel on uh, poetry oh. and fragile earth with uh -huh. uh, Ruth Padel and Abhay K. So um, again, just to remind everyone, uh, Yes. Yeah. To so, totally. Yes. Yeah. Right. Thank you for for reminding us. Thank you. Thank you, Chen, and thank you for staying awake for so long. Must be around one a.m. <laughs> I am so excited. I won't be able to sleep for another two hours. <laughs> thank you all for for your wonderful poetry and the comments and discussion. I'm I'm, I'm completely awake. <laughs> Well, we hope you have a good night's sleep after this, at least. <laughs> yes, I will try my best. <laughs> Maybe I'll stay up to write some more poetry. <laughs> Probably. I mean, that's also a good idea. Good reason for staying up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. So thank you, Chun. Thank you, uh, Fiona. Thank you, Norbert. Thank you, Lorette. And thank you, Elan. And of course, thank you so much, Elena. Um, this was a wonderful, wonderful session. And um, you all always give us so much to think about and so much to learn from and so much inspiration. So thank you. And mm -hmm. uh, we look forward to seeing you again in future events. Um, and um, well, have a wonderful day. Yes, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, if, I might, if I may add, uh, I'm deeply grateful to all the distinguished poets for their inspiring poems and to the enthusiastic public who seem to have been deeply immersed in our topic. And also a very warm thank you to our exquisite host, Rola Maria, without whose efforts this event would not have been possible. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day or evening, wherever you are, and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you so Take much. Take care. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye. Bye. Good night. <laughs>